folks, how are you? Everybody can can hear me, right? Good. Yep, good, Professor. I was. Uh, I hate to start with the nag, but I'm going to start with the nag anyway. I was just looking at the master sheet for the class where I've asked you to fill in the name of the company of valuing. A lot of empty spaces still, right? So if you've not filled in the name of your company, please do so by tomorrow. Because tomorrow I'll send an email to those people who have, that's the nice thing about a Google shared spreadsheet. They can look to see who's not entered a company name and I'll send you an email saying, as if you need one more email from me, but it'll be directed at you saying, when are you going to find a company? So you, you witness the nagging built to a crescendo if you don't kind of act soon. So pick a company, put it down. As I said, you can always come back and change you know, the company later if you don't think that that's a company for you. Are, are there any questions before we start about logistics, mechanics? So uh, if you notice, I sent you that weekly challenge last Wednesday. As I said, the weekly challenge is completely optional. You could do it, you could choose not to do it. It's really for you to build up your valuation craft. Yeah, and I think it'll help. So there'll be another weekly challenge that comes out after class today. Again, it's up to you to decide what to do with it, but no, do with it what you want, what you have to. Can we ask you so a question the, about, yeah, sure. sorry. Can we ask you a question ahead, about yeah. the week, weekly challenge uh, after class? Yeah. The last part about the growth? What about the girl? Why don't you ask me right now? Uh, I haven't pulled it out yet, but um, I okay, did. Okay. I, I you did can do it after it. class then. Do it. Let's do it after class then. So we'll do it after the class ends. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to ask if the TA review sessions will be recorded too. I will ask the TAs to do it. They haven't been recording it so far. Okay. Thank the you. Just session. because for I'll, me I'll pass it on. I'll tell them. Okay. Yeah, I will ask them to record it. So you, the, the, I kept, I did an office hour on Monday specifically for people who are in different time zones. And obviously it's early in the class, very few people actually showed up, but I'll do that once every two or three weeks, you'll see a session just for people who are 16 hours away, 13 hours away, because it, it, it's, you know, you can't obviously show up in my regular office hours, which might be in the middle of the night for you. Okay. Okay, so let's pick up um, by, by looking at something we're going to do today. And again, as with every one of these classes, we're going to start with a test, which we're going to get to today, but I'm going to hit you with the test ahead of time. So one of the things you need to value a company is an equity risk premium, right? You need a, a, an equity risk premium for a company. So today's start of the class test is I'm going to focus on three companies and I'm going to pick on one of you. And I'm not doing it to pick on you, but to kind of get you involved and ask you how you'd compute the equity risk premium for a company. So Veena, you're first on my list. Okay, so unmute yourself. So I'm gonna give you the scenario. You have an Israeli software company. It's headquartered and it's headquartered in Tel Aviv. It's, you know, it's incorporated and traded in, in Israel, but 95% of its revenues come from the US. You do know that Waze was actually an Israeli software company, right? It was created in Israel, built up in Israel. Google bought it. Uh, you know. So this is not an inconceivable example. This is an example of it. So here's my question. When you value this company and you have to use an equity risk premium, I'll give you three choices. You can use the equity risk premium for Israel because that's where it's incorporated and traded. You can use the equity risk premium for the US because that's where it gets a bulk of its revenues. Or maybe you have a solution that lets me bridge the difference. So Vina, what do you think? Israeli company gets 95% of its revenues in the US. What would you use as the equity risk premium for this company? Um, I'm not really sure, but I guess if you're valuing it in dollars, you would use a US equity risk premium. This is a very dangerous door you've opened, right? So if I decide my equity risk premium based on the currency I pick, then every emerging market company is going to be more valuable if I valued in dollars, right? Because then I would use the US I mean, would that make sense? If I have a risky Indian company, I value it in dollars, does the risk go away just because I've denominated in a different, because remember when I do the valuation in dollars, it's not like the company's cash flows are in dollars, they're in rupees, I'm converting them to dollars. The risk is still there, right? So let's suppose you know that, that you're looking at the risk of the company, whether it's in dollars or in shekel, its risk comes from 
where it does business, not where it's incorporated. So if it gets 95% of its revenues in the US, your equity risk premium would have to reflect where it gets its revenues, which would be 95% times the US equity risk premium plus 5% times the Israeli premium, whether you do it in shekels or dollars. And in fact, that's going to be my standard approach in most companies. If you ask me to estimate the equity risk premium for a company, rather than ask, where is it incorporated and traded? The question I'm gonna ask you is, where does it get its revenues? Now that's a little lazy though. You're saying, why are you using revenues? Why am I using revenues as my weights? Why couldn't I use um, EBITDA or EBIT or earnings or assets? Nick Long, why do you think I use revenues? Um, maybe because they have like different like tax policies or something like that, or different like accounting principles. I think you're overthinking it. Beggars can't be choosers. You know what the only metric most companies break down geographically is? Take a look at your own company, go through the annual report. The one metric that they will usually break down geographically is revenues. So it's, 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 it's a similar desperation, nothing else out there. The other is revenues are always positive. You're saying, so what? The weights will also be positive. Whereas if I use EBIT, DAO, or EBIT, who knows? I could have negative operating income in China, but I can't give a negative weight to a country. But let me add to this process. You have this Israeli company, gets 95% of its revenues in the US. We agree that that exposes more to US risk. But it is still an Israeli company subject to Israeli regulations, tax laws. And all of its software is written in Tel Aviv by Israeli software engineers. Might that alter your decision to give 95% weight to the US? Does this make it more of an Israeli company or less of an Israeli company in terms of risk? The fact that all of its software is written in Israel. Nick, Pavaron, what do you think? Sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Well, basically the revenues tell me it's 95% in the US, 5% in Israel. But now I've told you all the software that they sell is actually written in Israel. Does that make them more exposed to Israeli country risk or less exposed to Israeli country risk? Um, well, definitely more exposed to country risk if the internet system goes down or something. Or if the country goes to hell in a handbasket and the software engineers are not able to show up to work. I mean, that's what country risk worries you about, right? What if things get so bad, I can't get my operations going? So I'm gonna give you a second example to kind of build on that first one because we've said revenue weights, but then we threw this what if. Let's say, uh, Rebecca Choi, I'm gonna pick on you. This is gonna be an easy one. You're valuing a Nigerian oil company. It gets 100% of its oil in Nigeria. It's headquartered in trade in Nigeria, but it gets 95% of its revenues in the US and only 5% in Nigeria. If I ask you to compute the equity risk premium for this company, would you do it the same way you did the Israeli company of based on revenue weights? Or is it different when you have an oil company? Um, would it be different? And tell me why. It is going to be different. Tell me, give me the intuition as to why when you look at an oil company, you think of risk very differently than when you look at a software company. Um, because all of their oil like is in Nigeria. So it's all based on like Nigeria's risk instead of like the US. So let, let me play devil's advocate here. I told you all the software for the software for the software company was written in Tel Aviv. So what is the difference when I have an oil company telling me all of its production is in Nigeria, as opposed to a software company telling me all of its production is in Israel. Um, yeah, is it, yeah, if, let me help you around. Let's say the country goes to hell in a handbasket. If it's a software company, is there a way you can still survive? You put all your software engineers on a plane and you send them off someplace safe. It'll cost you money, but you could move your operations fairly easily, right? Because these are human beings, you could move them. If you're an oil company and Nigeria goes to hell in a handbasket. You can't you move. <laughs> You'd love to move the oil reserves to the middle of Switzerland, nice safe country, but it's not gonna work, right? So when you're looking at natural resource companies, revenues don't even matter. It's where you produce the resource 
that drives your risk. If you're a Chilean copper company, even if you sell 95% of your copper in the global market, your risk is still Chilean country risk. So with the software company, I went all revenues, partly because production is mobile. I can get deal with risk. With the oil company, I'm going all production. Let me give you a third example. And I'm going to be Marissa Liu. You're going to be my guinea pig for this. So third company is an Indian automobile company. Gets 95% of its revenues in the US, 5% in India. Now, what would you do? Think about what, how I differentiate between the software company and the oil company. Software company, if things go bad, you can move your engineers fairly easily. The oil company, things go bad, there's nothing you can do. Where do you think an automobile company falls in this mix? Um, doesn't it kind of depend where they're like- supplying? The plants are all in India. So if they have, so the question I'm asking is, if software engineers are easy to move and oil reserves are impossible to move, where would you put manufacturing plants? Also- Somewhere in the middle, right? They're, they're more difficult to move than software engineers, but they're easier to move than oil reserves. You can build a plant in a safer part of the world. Do you think, so what does that mean? When I compute the equity risk premium for an Indian automobile company, I might put half my weight on where you get your revenues and half my weight on where you produce the goods and services. I'm trying to preempt a question that you will have when you start to compute equity risk premium for your company. I know you're gonna ask me, should I use revenues or should I use production? And I'm going to respond with two words, it depends. And it's gonna piss you off. But you know what, I'm passing it back and say, you know this company, tell me how easy is it to move production? If it's really easy to move production and it's not a big deal, then focus on revenue. So if you give me a consumer product company, it's all revenues all the time. If you give me a natural resource company, it's all where you get your production. But some companies, it might be a mix of the two. But in none of these examples, did I take the easy way out? What's the easy way out? I look at where you're incorporated and traded and give you an equity risk premium based on that is the one non-starter. And here's an unfortunate fact. That is the default in most valuation and appraisal houses now is you base the equity risk premium based on where a company is located, not where it's operating. So that's, that's the overall lesson I'm gonna to reinforce today because to me, that makes no sense to focus on where a company is traded and incorporated to come up with the risk premium. So now we're going to turn to the packet. And I had trouble this morning when I was doing the other class getting to the page I want to. So let me see if I can do this. I'm just going to go to presentation mode, which is going to kind of shut you guys out for at least a moment. Maybe forever. I've lost my slides completely. Do you guys see any of my slides? I can't see my slides now. So basically I think I've lost my slides. So let me go back and reopen them. It's just a black screen right now. Yeah, just a black screen. It's a black screen, okay. Let me fix that. Okay, so let's review where we were last session. We were talking, um, um, I'll get to the slide. I, I just got my PowerPoint slide back and you should be able to see my screen fairly quickly whenever it gets ready. But let's review, we were talking about risk-free rates, right? And what's the rule on risk-free rates? When I ask you what risk-free rate are you going to use in your valuation, what determines that risk-free rate? Anna? What company are you value? Um, I chose Palantir. Palantir. What currency are you going to do the valuation? Uh, US. All right. So the risk-free rate is going to be the T-bond. Anybody value a non-US company? 
I mean, somebody must be. I'm valuing a Brazilian company. You're valuing a Brazilian company. Yeah. What's the first choice you <laughs> face? You're going to value it in reais. I'm going to value in US dollars. What are you going to value it in? Reais. Okay. So your risk free rate has to be a Brazilian real risk free rate. Little more trouble than Anna, right? Because Anna could look up the T bond rate and use it. What do you have to do to get a risk free rate? I need to subtract the default spread from the. You subtract the default spread from the government bond rate to get to risk free rate. So when you look at risk free rates, don't just look at the country where your company is in, make a choice in the currency. That's what's going to drive your risk free rate. Any questions about the process by which we got risk free rates? One of the things we looked at is the risk free rates are different across different currencies. Sebastian, do you remember why risk free rates vary across currencies? Once you cleaned up the risk free rates, why do risk free rates vary across currencies? Uh, is because there's a default risk between countries? No, no, we cleaned up for the default risk. After you cleaned up for the default risk, the Zambia and Quacha still had a much higher risk free rate than the US dollar, which had a much higher risk free rate than the euro. Remember what was the leftover factor? Oh, was it the, the inflation? Yeah. The inflation difference. Inflation? The inflation is there. Yeah. So high inflation currencies have high risk free rates, low inflation currencies have low risk free rates, and deflationary currencies could have negative risk free rates. Now, here's the reality we face. If you look at the T bond rate today, how Anna's valuing Palantir in, in, um, in US dollars, the T bond rate is about 1%. That's historically low. In fact, many people who are older investors will tell you that in the last decade, rates have been abnormally low, abnormally low. And technically they're right, right? The average T-bond rate in the 19, 1980s was six and a half to 7%. In the 1990s, it was close to 5%. In 2000 to 2010, it was down to about 4%. In the last decade, it's been down to about two, maybe two and a half percent. And if you ask most people why risk-free rates have been low, why the T-bond rate has been low, the answer you usually get is the Fed did. It's a Fed's doing, right? It's Jerome Powell working with an interest rate you know, lever, moving it up and down. But I'm going to give away a secret as to why rates have been low for the last decade. Remember this, the next time you're watching CNBC, and that market guru gets up and the Fed's been keeping rates low. Here's the real reason. Think of what goes into risk free rate. It's inflation and a real interest rate. And real interest rates over the long term have to converge on real growth rates, growth in the economy. So here's what I've done in this graph. I've taken the inflation rate each year, that's the orange column. On top of that, I put the real GDP growth each year. And I've constructed what I call an intrinsic risk free rate. So let me back up. If your inflation rate is 3% and your real growth rate is 2%, three plus two is five, that's my intrinsic risk free rate. I do that every year from 1960 to 2020. On top of that, I've superimposed the T-bond rate over that period. Do the two seem to move together, the intrinsic risk free rate and the T-bond rate? I look at that graph and it looks like they're almost in lockstep, right? If you ask me why have rates been low over the last 10 years, my answer is very simple. It's because inflation has been low and real growth has been anemic. What do you get when you add low plus low? You get low. Inflation has been low and growth has been low, rates are low. I'm not saying the Fed has no effect. Of course they have an effect, but they're, they're at the margin. If inflation had been 5% over the last 10 years and real growth had been 3%, I don't care who ran the Fed, there's no way rates would be at 2%. Risk-free rates are low because growth is low and inflation is low. And could you have negative interest rates? Absolutely. They're unusual, but not unnatural. We had a chance to look at the valuation of the week this week. Did any of you have a chance to look at it? At least you looked at the company, right? Nobody? Tim, have you looked at the valuation of the week? I just checked the company, Heineken. What's the company I use? Heineken. Heineken, Andreas Heineken. Why did I pick Heineken? Not because I like their beer, 
but I want you to value them in euros. And you know the big challenge in euros is? The risk-free rate is negative. And when the risk-free rate is negative, the question is, what do I do? In fact, analysts ask this all the time for the last decade, what do I do? And I want you to look at what I did and then try changing things. You know what I did? I left it where it is. It's not, my, it's not in my part to go change that number. That is what the risk-free rate is. It's minus 0.38%. And what's a conventional wisdom year? If the risk-free rate is that low, your value must go through the roof, right? You have low risk-free rate. And you're going to see that I find Heineken to be overvalued even with that low risk-free rate. And here's why. If risk-free rates reflect expectations about inflation and real growth in the future, what does a negative risk-free rate tell you about what people think about the future in Europe? Not the most upbeat reading, right? When you have negative risk-free rates, what the investing world is saying is there'll be deflation and perhaps even negative growth in Europe. You see why that's going to play out in your valuation? I know Heineken is a multinational, but it still gets about 45% of its revenues in Europe. If Europe is going to have this dark, low growth future, when I value Heineken, guess what kind of growth rate I'm going to give them? I'm going to give them a dark, low growth rate, and you're going to complain. In fact, I did this, the valuation of UC of Heineken, I did a 2019 version for a group of people from the finance department in Heineken. They asked me, can you, can you do a session on and I did them and they complained about their growth rates and you're giving us such low growth. And I say, you haven't seen the worst of it yet because when I get to your terminal value and I look at your growth rate forever, you know what growth rate I'm gonna give you? If your risk-free rate is minus 0.38% and it tells me that the future is bleak, your growth rate in perpetuity is also gonna be minus 0.38%. And they almost went on strike. They said, that's not fair. And I said, you didn't complain when I gave you that really low risk-free rate. And I gave you a three and a half percent cost to capital. What one hand gives you, the other hand takes away. So if you take a company and you decide to value that company in a high inflation currency, your discount rates will be much higher but so will your cash flows and your growth rates. If you take that same company and do your valuation in euros or dollars, your discount rates will be much lower, but so will your growth rates and so will your cash flows. And if you do it right, you will get the same value for the company, no matter what currency you pick. So my advice to you is pick a currency and stay consistent. Any questions about risk free rates? Now let's talk about the equity risk premium. The equity risk premium is the premium you demand over and above the risk free rate to invest in stocks collectively. It's the price of risk in the equity market. The problem with the equity risk premium is you can't observe it. People don't tell you my price of risk is 5%. So historically, here's how people have estimated the equity risk premium. They've looked backwards. You're saying, what does it even mean? If I ask an analyst, what will the equity risk premium be for US stocks for the next year? Here's what they do. They go back 80 years. They collect the returns you'd have made in stocks over the last 80 years. They look at what you'd have made as returns on T-bonds over the last 80 years. And they take the difference. So if you'd made 8% investing in stocks and 5% investing in T-bonds, eight minus five is three. That's a historical risk premium. That's where much evaluation is done is using historical risk premiums. And I don't like it. And I'll tell you what I don't like about historical risk premiums. Take a look at this table at the bottom of this page. I report the historical risk premiums for the US. You know what the historical risk premium that you've earned on equities in the US has been? Some number between four and 14%. You think, what? Four and 14? How can there be that much of a spread? It depends on what slice of history I look at. In this table, for instance, I've looked at three slices of history, one going back to 1928, that's 92 years of history, the other going back 50 years, and the third going back 10 years, I get very different risk premiums. It depends on whether I compare what I make on stocks to T-bills, which are short-term, or T-bonds, which are long-term, I get different risk premiums. It even depends on how I compute an average. You're saying there's only one way to compute an average? Not really. There's a simple average where you take 80 years, add them up and divide by 80. Or there's a compounded average, a geometric average. I get different premiums. 
Now do you see why Anvis like this table? Because you can use whatever number you want and get away with it saying it's somewhere in the table. I use four, oh, that's there. Six, not a problem, it's there. 10, not a problem. We talked about how bias affects valuation. This feeds into that bias. And I'm gonna undercut even that number. Remember in statistics, when you make an estimate, what are you trained to put in brackets below that number to tell the world how uncertain you are about the number? You put an estimate and then you put a standard error. You remember that in statistics? The standard error tells the world, oh, by the way, this is how wrong I could be. I'm gonna bring that practice into this table. Remember every single one of these numbers is an estimate based on 90, 50, 10 years of data. And every one of these numbers is a standard error. Let me show you how big that standard error is. Let's say I go all the way back to 1928. That's 92 years of data. And I told you the equity risk premium has been roughly 4.84%. That sounds awfully precise, right? 4.84%. That's a geometric average stocks versus T-bonds, 4.84%. Don't get too excited. Because the standard error in that number is 2.18%. Think about that. If this were a statistics class and you told me my estimate is 4.8%, oh, by the way, there's a 2.2% standard error in that estimate. You know what you've told me, right? You've told me pretty much nothing. The true equity risk cream could be anywhere below 1% or above 9%. And that's with 92 years of data. If I go back 50 years or 10 years, that standard error becomes so large, it becomes almost unmanageable. Historical risk premiums are not just backward looking. They don't just assume, not, not only do they assume that you go back to whatever things used to be, they're also incredibly noisy. I'll give you my alternatives to historical risk premium, but let's stay with that historical risk premium approach. Let's say that's the only tool you have in your toolbox. There are two problems with that premium. One is the noise I talked to the standard error. The other is you're looking at the US. You're saying, so what? You know what the most successful equity market of the 20th century was? It was the US. One of the few markets that had an uninterrupted history through the 20th century, the sec people continued to trade through the Second World War. You think, so what? Have you heard of this term called selection bias? Where you pick a winner and then you extrapolate from there everything. We picked the best performing equity market of the 20th century. We're extrapolating what the risk premium should be from it. That's pretty dangerous, right? What we should be really looking at is not what the premium was in US equities, but what the premium was across 20 or 25 or 30 different equity markets across the 20th century. And there's actually, a, uh, uh, Credit Suisse actually create, puts out this book every, if you get a chance and you can find the book online, look for it, I'll send you some links so you can look for it where you know, a couple of researchers at London Business School look across 21 different equity markets, not just the US, and they look at what the historical risk premium has been across these markets. Australia, for instance, we go from 1900 to 2017, the risk premium has been 5%. Austria, it's been about 2.9%. Globally, that average has been about 3.2%. Lower than the US, but that's to be expected, right? Because you have some markets that are loser markets. If you'd put your money in that market, you'd have lost it all maybe in the 1940s. And some markets are winner markets and you have no idea which market you're looking at today. How do you know what the winner of the 21st century is? You might think it's gonna be a particular market, but we won't know till a hundred years from now. But that leaves us with a problem, which is if you need a lot of history to estimate a historical risk premium, and I ask you to estimate the equity risk premium for Vietnam. If you get a chance, if you watch my Bloomberg video that I put one of the companies to look at, it's been a milk, a Vietnamese milk company. It's a very fascinating company if any of you want a company to value. And I want an equity risk premium for Vietnam. I could try to get a historical risk premium for Vietnam. But you know what the problem's gonna be? How many years of history do you think I'm gonna get for Vietnam? Definitely not a hundred years of data. If I'm lucky, maybe what, eight, nine, 10 years. What am I gonna learn from that? It's complete noise. So the challenge here is even if you believe you've got a risk premium for the US based on historical data, how the heck do you come up with risk premiums for Brazil, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, 
Ghana, Nigeria. There's no 100 years of data. So what I'm gonna do through much of the rest of this class is talk about how I would come up with equity risk premiums for other countries. And I'm gonna start with the simplest way of doing it. Remember how we came up with risk-free rates in currencies? So I wanted a Brazilian risk-free rate, Rodrigo pointed out that you'd subtract out the default spread for Brazil from the government bond rate to come up with the risk-free rate. What is the default spread measure? Roughly speaking, it measures the risk in that country's bonds. I could cheat and say, you know what? If I have a default spread for a country, that is an additional risk premium. So I'm gonna take my US risk premium and add that portion. That, so let's say the default spread for Brazil is 2.65%. Remember that was one of the default spreads we did come up with for Brazil last session. Let's say I, I think the default spread is 2.65%. And the equity risk premium in the US is 4.72%. Let's say that's what my premium is. And we'll talk about where that number came from. My equity risk premium for Brazil will be the equity risk premium for the US plus 2.65%. Raja, your question? How do you reconcile having a, you know, low real growth in the risk-free rate in the US, but having in the last 10 years, 14% growth in markets? How you just showed in the last slide. Well, because risk-free rates are down, you know, lower your required return, you could have cash flows. Two things, one is when you say low growth rate, what does the economy have to do with what you get out of stocks? You get growth in earnings, right? You know what the growth in earnings for US companies has been over the last 10 years? It's been close to 10%. So first we've got to separate economies from earnings growth. And we can talk about how it is that companies and slow growing economies can still post earnings growth. In the US, if you think about the biggest companies, they tend to be multinationals. What does it matter? In fact, I would argue everywhere in the world, we have to stop focusing on domestic growth and think about earnings growth in companies because that's the growth you get as an investor. So that resolves part of the problem is you have slow growth economies, but earnings have grown at much healthier rates. The second is over the decade, risk-free rates have come down. Why, why does that matter? Because if you have lower risk-free rates, that same earnings will be worth more because you're discounting at a lower rate. So over the last decade, that's how you reconcile the two factors. Can they continue for the next decade? That's a different question. Because you could argue that maybe the risk-free rates have gotten as low as they get. How much lower can they get? So you could, don't get much oomph from that. And if earnings growth has run its course, and this is now a global slowdown, you can't go to China and get that 15% growth anymore. The next decade could look very different, but the last decade I can explain. The next decade, who knows? That's why there's uncertainty. Yeah. Jonathan? So professor, you're making the point that um, only the, or practically only the US has a long enough historical data for equity risk. And even there, what did I say about the historical data? I said, I don't trust it. It's still not long enough. Right, right. You know what? I need about 250 years of historical data, of uninterrupted historical data. And there is no market in the world where I can get that. The US you can get to 92, which is about as long, or maybe a hundred years. I think, you know, uh, Robert Schiller has data going to 1871. So you maybe even go to hundred. But the US is the only market in the world where you have a shot at getting reliable historical data on a liquid market going back more than a hundred years. Right, um, I, my, my question was sort of leading into, uh, for, for American companies or companies that are both based and make their money in America, why does the equity risk premium outside really uh, significant? Like, why would we care in that sense? If their operations are all in the U.S., you care hardly about the U.S. equity risk premium. Okay. But you don't okay. know what it is, right? So it's uh, so. I uh, how many companies are there that actually can tell you that their entire business is? Remember, it's not just where you get your revenues; it's where you produce your goods. You know what? The companies that are able to do both in the US are the exception, not the rule. Even the companies that get 100% of their revenues in the US often have their production facilities in Vietnam. It's very difficult to find truly insulated companies anymore. I see, I see. So is everybody clear on the first approach to get the equity risk premium for a country? Start with the US premium and we can debate whether that's reliable or not, add the default spread to it. That is the default way in which most investment banks get equity risk premiums for other countries is they add the default spread. Now do you see why I took all that time taking the default spread out of the government bond rate? 
Because if I did not do that, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start with the government bond rate as my risk-free rate. I'm going to add this higher risk premium on top of it, in which case I've counted the 2.65% twice, once in the government bond rate and once in that. Here's a second approach. Goldman came up with this approach probably 30 years ago. They said, let's say we know the equity risk premium for the US. And every one of these approaches starts with that presumption. Let's say it's 4.72%. Let's say the standard deviation in US equities is 18%. You can look that up, right? Historical standard deviation in the S&P 500. But the Bovespa standard deviation is 30%. And you can look it up by looking at the very, set, let's set up an algebra problem. You invest in the 18% standard deviation market, you're settling for 4.72%. But now if I ask you to invest in the Brazilian market, which is about 1.67 times more volatile, 30 divided by 18, I'm gonna scale my equity risk premium up by that ratio, 30 over 18. I come up with an equity risk premium for Brazil of 7.89%, which means I'm charging an extra 3.17% for being in Brazil because Brazil is a riskier market. Looks good, right? When I first looked at this approach, I said, this makes sense. But then I tried applying it to different countries and I found myself running into a problem. I tried this approach on the Egyptian market. I know you guys are all intimately familiar with the Egyptian market, so you can help me out here. And I came up with a very strange result. You know what the standard deviation of the Egyptian market is? It's like 5%. It's almost not, not you saying that's weird. Why is the standard deviation so low? What drives standard deviations? It's what oh. you see in prices. For prices to reflect it, people have to trade. If there's no liquidity in the market and people very seldom trade, you know what's gonna to happen to your standard deviation? It's gonna to drop towards zero. A market where nobody ever trades is gonna have a standard deviation of zero. It could be the riskiest economy in the world and the riskiest market because if you actually try to trade, the price would move, but nobody trades. What you see as standard deviation in a market reflects not just the risk in the market, but also the liquidity of the market. So Costa Rica looks like it should have a lower risk premium than the US if you trust standard deviations. Much of Africa looks like it should have really low standard deviation because liquidity is not there. So if you see the Bloomberg, the Gold, Goldman approach being used, it will work for markets like Brazil where there's enough liquidity. It will break down in markets where there's no liquidity. So let's see where we are. You could try the default spread approach, bludgeon. Basically, you take the default spread, you apply it to every company. You could try the Goldman approach, but that assumes the standard deviation captures the risk in the market. Which leads me to a third approach. And this is the approach I've latched on to. And you don't have to follow me down this path. It's, it's what works for me. I took the first approach where I took the default spread. And I'll tell you what troubles me about the approach. The default spread is what I would charge for buying a bond issued by that country, right? So in the case of Brazil, I'm saying, if I'm buying a bond issued by the Brazilian government, I would charge 2.65% as my extra premium. But I'm not interested in buying a Brazilian bond, I'm interested in buying Brazilian equities. So let me ask you a, a simplistic question. Are equities generally riskier than bonds or safer than bonds? They're generally riskier because you're the last guy in line, right? So I said, if I can somehow figure out how much riskier Brazilian equities are than Brazilian bonds, I can take the default spread I get for Brazilian bonds and scale it up, like an algebra problem again. And I looked up two numbers. I looked up the standard deviation above us, but 30% you already saw. And the standard deviation of the Brazilian government bond which was 20%. So take a look at those numbers. What does it tell you? Brazilian equities are about one and a half times more volatile than Brazilian bonds, right? And what am I charging as my premium for Brazilian bonds? 2.65%. One and a half times 2.65% gives me an extra risk premium for Brazil of 3.98%. That's a 2.65% scale down. I add that to my US equity risk premium. That would be an equity risk premium for Brazil of 8.7%. So it's a three step, right? The first step is you get the premium for the US. I don't care what approach you use, that becomes your base number. Second step is you get a default spread for the country, either using a CDS spread or a rating or a government bond. Third step is you scale that spread up to reflect the additional risk of equities. 
That's your equity risk premium for the country. I first started doing this, I think in 1992 on my website. I did for like 35 countries and each year it's become a bigger and bigger exercise. So I'll show you what the numbers look like at the start of 2021. The equity risk premium I used for the US was 4.72%. I'll come and back it up in a few minutes. For every country I looked up the rating for the country and if it had a sovereign CDS, the CDS spread, the default spread. For so every company that had a country that had a rating, there are about 140 countries, I was able to get a rating and a default spread. If you are a AAA rated country, like what Germany, Australia, Singapore, here's what I did. I took my US equity risk premium and attached it to your country. So Singapore, Germany, Australia, Netherlands, all will have 4.72% premiums because I view AAA as being essentially no default risk. If you're not AAA rated, I come up with a default spread for your country. And I used to try to get the equity in the government bond like I did for the Bavespa for every market. I very quickly gave up because most of these countries, there is no government bond that is traded or even if it's listed, it's not very liquid. So I cheat, here's what I do to cheat. I say, look, I can't get this for every, every emerging market but I can get it collectively across emerging markets by looking at an index. S&P actually has an index of emerging market equities. I looked up the standard deviation and index. S&P has another index of emerging market government bonds and I look up the standard deviation that index and I take the ratio. And the start of 2021, that ratio is 1.10. What does that tell me? Across emerging markets, equities are about 1.1 times more volatile than government bonds. I know I put through a lot of things at you. So here's where we are. You have the US equity risk from 4.72%. Let's say you're looking at Brazil, 2.65% default spread. I multiply the 2.65% by 1.1. I come up with like 2.9%. I add the 2.9% to 4.72%. I get a risk premium for Brazil. And I repeat this for 140 countries. When I'm done, I have a picture. This is by far the most heavily downloaded data set on my website. It shows up in the strangest places. I don't control where it shows up because it's out there. People can use it. Now, I, I still remember getting an email from the New Zealand Milk Board. I didn't even know there was a Milk Board in New Zealand until I got this email. And here's how the email went. It said, we're using your equity risk premiums to determine milk prices for New Zealand farmers. Now, I'm responsible if they starve. We are using your equity risk premiums. How do you come up with these numbers? And I have a little PDF document I sent saying, look, this isn't rocket science. I'll tell you how I do it. But once in a while I do get an email, I'm not even sure how to respond to it because it's so out of left field. I still getting, get, I remember getting an email from Lebanon. I don't get that many emails from the Middle East. So I'm excited to open it up and say, um, an email basically is, you know, uh, I am in Lebanon, I run a business, I, need an, I have an equity risk premium, and I notice you have an equity risk premium for Lebanon. And it's a really high number, why? I said, look out of the window. You can probably tell why, you're in a risky part of the world, your equity risk premium reflects it. Do you need to give me an intellectual reason? But basically this is, you know, it, it, it is basically what it, you know, it reflects. The, it's, there's no rocket science. I'm not bringing any intellectual fire parts based on default spreads and scaling them up. And in fact, if you look at the top right-hand corner of this graph, I know it's very difficult to see, but let me focus on it if I can. If you look at the top right-hand corner, I give up, it's, uh, no. I won't even try because You look at the top right-hand corner, notice that there are a bunch of countries listed as Algeria. So let's see if I can pull the mouse at least over there. Algeria, Brunei, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea, Guyana, Haiti. You know what they share in common? These are what are called frontier markets. What are frontier markets? These are markets where there is no sovereign rating. Remember I found a rating for India, for Brazil, for China. These are the countries which have no ratings. You think why? 
No, are any of you planning to go and work at S&P or Moody's or the ratings group? Let's say you do, you're in the sovereign ratings group. Your boss calls you in the day after you join with an assignment. He said, we have a new country we're gonna rate. We're gonna send you off there to do the research. You're all very excited, you're just being hired. They're gonna send you off to a foreign country. So where? They said, North Korea. You probably quit on the spot, right? Can you imagine being sent to North Korea saying, go dig a little deeper so we can do it? These are countries where the rating agencies basically say, we're not going there. I'm not going to the Sudan to assess it. It's just too risky. And for the longest time, I did not have equity risk premiums until about 2015. I didn't have equity risk premiums for these countries. And my defense was, if I can't find a rating, I can't get a default spread. If I can't get a default spread, I can't get an equity risk premium. Until in 2016, I get an email from a Syrian business person. There's actually one guy left in Syria who's actually running a business too. He says, I'm running a Syrian business and I need a hurdle rate for projects. And I need an equity risk premium for Syria. And I went on your website and I could not find Syria. Why? So I told him, look, you know, Syria doesn't have a rating. I can't get a default spread. If I can't get a default spread, I can't get an equity risk premium. And he said, so what do you expect me to do? This is how he emails me back. So what do you expect me to do? How do I take projects if you don't give me an equity risk premium? To which my response, if you're worrying about equity risk premiums in the middle of Syria, maybe you're worrying about the wrong thing right now, but that wasn't the answer he was looking for. He wanted a number. I said, you know what? I'm gonna try. So I'll tell you how I get equity risk premiums in these frontier markets. Let's take uh, Myanmar. And I'm picking Myanmar for a reason. This was at the start of 2020. You know what's happened in Myanmar since the start of 2020, right? You've been reading the news, we'll come back and talk about it. There was no rating. But there's a service in Europe called Political Risk Services, which actually comes up with the country risk score. The lower the score, the riskier the country. The higher the score, the safer the country. Myanmar had a score of, I think, 63.75. You think, what are you going to do with that? I went looking for countries with roughly the same score, 60 to 65. And I found about seven countries with scores between 60 and 65. Five had ratings and I had computed equity risk premiums for that. So you know what I did? I took the average of that risk premium attached to Myanmar. You're saying, that is so simplistic. If you can come up with a better way of estimating equity risk premiums in North Korea and Myanmar, I'd love to hear it. But for the moment, this is the best I can do. But I've essentially got the world covered. And here's why I need the world, even if I'm looking at just a US company or a German company, because I've got to get from these country risk premiums to a company risk premium. And I'll give you three broad ways you can do it. The first is what I call the bludgeon approach, where you take the risk-free rate, you take beta times a mature market premium, the US can be the basis, and then you add the country risk premium on top of it, 3%, 5%, 7%. The second approach is very similar, but what you do is you put it in the brackets and you multiply by the beta. What does that do? If you're a high beta company, you're more exposed to country risk than a low beta company. So the first approach, every company gets a constant. The second approach, Depending on your beta, you could be more or less exposed. And I'm going to present a third approach that's going to look sophisticated, but there's really not that much sophisticated behind it. I'm going to argue that a company's exposure to country risk can be very different from its exposure to all other risks. Beta measures exposure to all other risks, but country risk is different. And I'm going to measure your exposure to country risk with a separate factor. And so using the beta, let's call it a lambda. And I'll give you the concoction that I use for lambda to come up with that exposure. Fixed amount, scale it to beta, scale it to a lambda. But in doing all of this, I have to make a fundamental choice. How do I come up with that country risk premium for a company? And as I said, the default approach in many banks, many appraisal houses, you tell me where you're incorporated. It's the Israel, okay, I'll give you the Israeli equity risk premium. It's Nigeria, I'll give you the Nigerian equity risk premium. You're in India, Indian equity risk premium. And I think that's just plain wrong. Your risk as a company doesn't come from where you're incorporated and traded, it comes primarily from where you do business, where you manufacture your goods, where you sell your goods. To me, that's intuitive. I've never understood the pushback you get on this because there is, there is a lot of pushback I get on it because it doesn't make sense to me. 
So if you gave me a company's revenues, in this case, for instance, I've taken two companies, Embraer in 2004. You guys familiar with Embraer? You might have, if you've flown any short haul flights in the US and you look at one of those small aircraft, check out next time. You know, it's either a Bombardier or an Embraer that you probably fly. They make smaller aircraft, you know, 20 passengers, 30 passengers. So it's a kind of aircraft you get and you sit in your seat, you don't get out. It's just you're locked into your seat because you know, everybody's kind of crammed in. But Embraer is a pretty well-regarded aerospace company. It's a Brazilian company. And in 2004, I valued Embraer. And when I looked at the company, it got 97% of its revenues in the US and Western Europe and 3% in Brazil. It's a Brazilian company, but it gets almost all of its revenues outside Brazil. The weighted average of the equity risk premiums I used was essentially the equity risk premium for Embraer, reflecting the fact that it got the bulk of its revenues outside. I could take another Brazilian company, Embev. Embev is, you know, I don't know whether you've ever been to Brazil, but they make the, the Guarana, which is the, the basic, the, the, they make a lot of beer, let's put it that way. At one point in time, they were primarily a Brazilian company, but now they're a Latin American company. You look at their revenues, they get it from all over Latin America. In fact, you know, they also get a little portion probably from outside, from Canada. Their equity risk premium is a weighted average of where they sell their beer. Weighted by what? By revenues. Why am I using revenues? Because A, I'm lazy, and B, because beggars can't be choosers. It's often the one number that's breaking, broken down geographically. Unless you think that this is something that you just have to do with emerging market companies, let that thought go. If, you, if any of you is valuing Coca-Cola, and I think a couple of you are because I saw the name show up on your Google shared spreadsheet. You think you have a nice US company, right? It's Atlanta based. I don't think there's an extra equity risk premium for Atlanta. But Coca-Cola is a US company, but it gets a big chunk of its revenues from outside the US. So the equity risk premium I use for Coca-Cola reflects where it gets revenues. And notice here, I've broken the world down by region. You know why I broke it down by region? Because again, that's how Coca-Cola breaks. It doesn't tell you the 75 countries, it breaks it down by region. I forgot to show this to you, but when, when you go back to the page where um, I have the equity risk premiums by country, I also, in that page, if you look at it, at the bottom of every region have a weighted average for the region. So Eastern Europe, Africa, the weighted average reflects the equity risk premium. So all of the countries in the region weighted by their GDP. So if you're looking at Latin America, Brazil is the biggest part of Latin America. I'll weight it more than I do Guatemala or Honduras. And the reason I compute those weighted averages is precisely because many companies don't break their revenues down by country, they break them down by region. Now, at some point, you're gonna to have to do this for your company. And when you try to do this for your company, you're gonna get really pissed off by how badly companies break revenues down. I'll give you a couple of classics. You're analyzing a US company. You know what a lot of US companies do when you ask them for a breakdown of revenues? They'll say, we get 71% of our revenues from the US, 29% from, the rest of the world. Come on, guys. Can you be a little more specific? The rest of the world is a really big place. But you know what? There's nothing you can do. That's how they're broken down. So you've got to attach an equity risk premium to the rest of the world. And you can do it by taking a weighted average of the rest of the world. Or a lot of companies, if you break their revenues down, I don't know what this is, but they often will combine Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, EMEA. Don't ask me why they do it. It's an absolutely absurd way of breaking revenues down because you've mixed one of the riskiest parts of the world, Africa with one of the safest parts, which is Northern Europe. In fact, if I had my druggers, I would not let companies report Europe as a region. You know why Northern Europe and Southern Europe are very different equity risk premiums. So if you tell me you're in Europe, I'd love to know whether you're in Spain or whether you're in the Netherlands. It makes a big difference in the equity risk premium. But take what you're given. If that's all you have, do the best you can to get an equity risk premium that reflects where your company is. Uh, 
Because the problem with all of these approaches, they're very revenue focused, right? That's all you care about. But as we saw, even with that test, we did, where you produce, where your software engineers live, where you manufacture things could affect your risk premium. And the reality also is that even if you put the number in brackets, your beta might not be a good proxy for your exposure to country risk. So I want to deal with those questions next. But before I do that, any questions about what we've done, what we've done in terms of you know looking at where your operations are and country risk premiums. Go ahead, Mother. Uh, Professor, I was just wondering, would you then also take a weighted average uh, depending on revenue or operations for your risk-free rate because you won't entirely have? No, 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 never mess with the risk-free rate. That would be like my, I'll give you an absurd analogy and you're gonna think it's ridiculous. If I took the temperature in New York and Celsius, in, in Fahrenheit, and the temperature in Frankfurt and Celsius, added the two numbers up and divided by two, what would that number even mean, right? I take 80 degrees Fahrenheit plus 25 degrees Celsius, add the two numbers up. When you start to average out across risk free rates, you're averaging a measurement mechanism. So never ever mess with the risk free rate. The risk free rate, make a choice. You want to do things in dollars, that's your risk free rate. Because as a multinational, you could have 40 currencies, but you still want to focus on the currency of choice in your analysis. Thanks, Professor. Jake? Oh yeah, um, when you're finding the average risk premium in a region, how do you weight the countries? Is it by GDP. population? Okay. GDP, right? Population is not the issue, right? It's how much you contribute to that size of the economy. So when you tell me you're in Asia, my guess is that China is your biggest market. I mean, I might be wrong, but if that's all you give is I get a lot of revenues in Asia. It's very unusual to see a company that gets its revenues from Vietnam, not China. So the GDP is the closest thing I can get to where your potential revenues are coming from. But I'd much rather have the detail if you have it, right? So if you know how much you get in China, just let me know why hide it behind this regional breakdown. But it is what it is. Okay, so let's talk about when you might leave revenues. A few years ago, I actually valued Royal Dutch. And I did this for the corporate finance group at Royal Dutch in London. And they did, asked me to value Royal Dutch. And I, came into the valuation and they were horrified by how big the equity risk premium was. I still remember the CFO saying, you know, why is our equity risk premium 8.28%? That looks like an emerging market premium. And I said, you are an emerging market company. They said, what? We're Royal Dutch. We've been around 150 years. We're a UK slash Dutch company. Where's the emerging market? I said, where do you get your oil? It's definitely not in the UK and the Netherlands anymore. It's in the riskiest parts of the world. Why? Because that's what God does. He puts oil in a part of the world that so makes it risky. So it's a mixed blessing, right? What part of the world has oil and it doesn't have risk that goes with? It's almost like a mixed blessing. So what I did for Royal Dutch is I took where they got, the, and this is part of their annual report. It's not like private information. It's in their annual report. I took where they got their oil and grab, uh, the oil and gas production and I took a weighted average. Why is the equity risk premium so high? Because as a percent of the total, their biggest the, the biggest parts of the world is Nigeria and Oman. That feeds into a high equity risk premium. It reflects that reality. Finally, I, also, I want to talk a little bit about this land debt that I threw out at you. I'll give you a little bit of the history of land debt to show you how little intellectual reasoning went behind it about um, I've been going to Brazil almost every year since 1997. I teach it and I do a two-day valuation seminar there. And every year I fly out to Brazil and I do the seminar and I come back. And this was, I think, 2004, 2005. I'm flying out to Brazil. I was taking the overnight flight from New York to Sao Paulo. One of the nice things about Brazil is at least you're pretty close to the same time zone, say flying north-south. But it's a long flight. It's like 11-hour flight. So I get on the plane, I am next to this incredibly obese person who's spilling over into my seat. It's obvious that I'm not going to sleep tonight. And I said, look, I'm going to be awake anyway. So let me check out the presentation I'm going to make tomorrow. So I pull up the slide packet after the next day. And the two companies I was valuing were Embev and Embraer. And in 2004, I was doing what everybody did, which is treat them as Brazilian companies. When I happened to look at the pie charts, each company had about where they got their revenues. And look at the pie chart for 
and Briar, I got this 97% in US and Western Europe, 3% in Brazil. And look at Ambev in 2004, they got almost all their revenues in Brazil. So I'm gonna start with an intuitive statement. You tell me whether you agree. They're both Brazilian companies, right? But if I ask you which one of these companies is more exposed to Brazilian country risk? Okay. Bridget, you be my, my guinea pig here. Two companies, one gets 3% of its revenues in Brazil, the other gets almost all of its revenues in Brazil. Which one's more exposed to Brazilian country risk? Um, well, I, I think if there are other business factors like where- Forget about production. all the other business factors, just focus on revenues. You get almost all of your revenues in the country, the other one gets only 3% of its revenues in the country. Um, I'd say the country that gets all its revenues from Brazil. I'd would say Ambev is more exposed to Brazilian country yeah. risk because Brazil goes to hell in a handbasket, your revenues are going to suffer, right? So I started with that and said, well, maybe we need to have a measure of how exposed a company is to country risk. And I concocted a measure and I called it Lambda. You know why I called it Lambda? It's a little secret. You come up with any measure and give it a Greek alphabet. For whatever reason, attaching a Greek alphabet to something gives this layer of sophistication that people don't push back on. The only people who are not impressed by this are the Greeks. They keep accusing me of stealing their language, but I tell them, you don't have a problem with me. Take it up with the option guys. They stole your language. Oh, they have Delta, Gamma, Theta. They, they've gone the distance. Every, every alphabet has been taken. But my objective with Lambda was to try to come up with the map. So it's a long flight. I think about it. Like, this makes sense. Tomorrow in my seminar, I'm going to bring this out. So I show up, you know, I haven't slept for, you know, I don't know, 24 hours. I'm kind of groggy. But there are 100 Brazilians in the room. And I say, you know, you know what? Maybe we should be measuring the exposure of Brazilian companies to Brazilian country risk. And I throw out this you know, measure like Lambda. And then one of the more practical people in the audience says, that's nice, but how do you plan to measure this lambda? I said, I haven't thought about that yet, but I have a long flight back and, and I'll think about it on my way back. And I did. In fact, I wrote a paper on my way back. Half the things I've written, I've been on long flights where I have nothing to do. This was before the days of Netflix. Today, I just watch Netflix show after Netflix show. Yeah, but those days I used to be productive. It's, if you go to my website, it's called Estimating Company Risk Exposure to Country Risk. I'll send you the link. And I laid out a few things that I would look at to measure land. I'd say, I'd like to know where your revenues are, obviously. I'd like to know where your production is. I'd also like to know what risk management products you use to kind of hedge your risk. And I'd like to know whether the government views you as a company in the national interest. There are some companies that governments label, right? This company is in the national interest. God help you once you're labeled, because then you're kind of tied with the country in terms of everything that happens in that country. And I said, those are things I'd know. And then I went to measure, how would I measure that Lambda? And the simplest measure that I could think of was revenues. So I'll give you an example again. And I'll use an Indian group to illustrate that. You take the Tata group. The biggest part of the Tata group is Tata Consulting Services. By far the largest market cap company. But another more older part of the Tata group is Tata Motors. They're both Tata companies. They're both incorporated in India. And this was, I think, in 2008 or 2009. Here's what the number, they're both Indian companies, but here's what the big difference was. Tata Motors was getting 91% of its revenues in India. And Tata Consulting Services was getting 8% of its revenues in India. Now, I know intuitively the 8% should be less exposed than the 91%, but here's how I convert into a number. The typical Indian company gets about 80% of its revenues from India. You see where I'm gonna go next? You get 91% of your revenues. The typical Indian company gets 80%, 91 divided by 80 gives me a Lambda 1.14. Why is it greater than one? Because you get more than the typical company of your revenues in India. Tata Consulting Service gets only 8% of its revenues in India. You divide that by 80%, you get roughly 0.10. I know it's simplistic and I'm basing it on revenues, but at least I get a measure of Lambda. And as I was writing this, I said, you, it's quite clear, it's simplistic. I'm ignoring all the rest of the stuff where your operations are, what risk management products you might have. So I suggest a second approach, much more complex, but one that will be a fuller measure of Lambda. When I ask you to estimate the beta for a stock, Rebecca Choi, I'm gonna pick on you again. If I ask you to estimate the beta for a stock, what are we trying to do? What, what do we run? What's the regression we run? 
Um, it's to kind of test the risk of that industry. But what? But we get it from a regression, right? So what is the regression we run to get a beta? If you want to pass, I, that's perfectly okay. Um, yeah, could I pass this one? <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer and tell me what's the regression we run to get a beta for a company? CAPM. CAPM is the model where we use the beta, but how do we get the beta? We run, we get it from a regression. What's the regression we get it from? Nick? Linear regression. Of what against what? Um, of the returns of the stock versus the market basket. So it returns the stock against the market index and the beta measures how as this market moves. So betas measure how you move relative to the market. What am I trying to answer here? Lambda measures how much you're exposed to country risk, right? So here's what I did. I ran a regression of returns, in this case, Embraer and Embratel, two Brazilian companies, not against the market index, because that will just give me beta, but against the C bond. The C bond was a Brazilian dollar denominated bond. And the reason the C bond is significant is when Brazil is having a bad time, the country risk is going up, the price of the C bond drops because people are worried. So Brazilian C bond became a proxy for country risk. You see what I'm trying to do here? By running this regression, I'm asking, how much is my stock affected by changes in country risk? So low number will mean it's less exposed, a high number will mean it's more exposed. So when I ran a regression of Embraer against um, the C bond, the slope, the number I got was 0.27, which means for every 1% change in the C bond, Embraer would draw, change only 0.27%, both up and down. So it's less exposed to country risk. In contrast, Embraer, which was the Brazilian telecom company, got 100% of its revenues in Brazil. That same coefficient when I ran the regression was about two. For every 1% movement in the C bond, the Embraer moved twice as much. I have my landers, my two companies based on a regression. Now, having said all of that, you know how often I use lambdas? Maybe, maybe one in 50 companies. For most of you, this is going to be an impractical approach because we're in five or six or seven countries. Think of how difficult it's going to be to get a lambda for each one. So with, when you have multiple countries, use the weighted average. You can use revenue weights, production weights, whatever your choice is. Do that and move on. But you might have, sometimes, it's nice to have this in your arsenal. If you have a company exposed to one country's risk and you're trying to figure out how exposed it is. Now, will these numbers all give you the same answer? Of course not. Otherwise, why treat them as different approaches? So let me show you how different the numbers will be depending on which of these different pathways you take. So let's say it's 2004, you're trying to estimate a cost of equity for Embraer in US dollar terms. So because it's in US dollar terms, your risk-free rate is the T-bond rate. It was about 4% in 2004. You start with that. For the moment, let's assume I give you a beta for Embraer. We'll come back and talk about where that beta comes from, but it's 1.07. And in 2004, the equity risk premium in the US was about 5%. So I've given you the base numbers. 4% is the risk-free rate. Beta is 1.07. The equity risk premium in the US was 5%. And in 2004, Brazil was a really risky country. The country risk premium for Brazil, the added number was 7.89%. The five different approaches, I could go through each one, but let me cut to the chase. If I treat Embraer as a Brazilian company and give it the full weight of the Brazilian country risk premium, the 7.89%, I end up with a cost of equity of 17, 18%. Why? Because the country risk premium for Brazil is so large. If I treat Embraer as a Brazilian company that gets a bulk of its revenues outside Brazil and give it a much lower risk premium, I get cost of equity of 9% or 10%. That's a big difference, right? Imagine valuing a company with a dollar cost of equity of 17% versus 10%. I'm gonna get very different answers. Clearly both can't be right. But most people use the 17% approach. They treat Brazilian companies as Brazilian, give them the entire cost of equity. And I'm going to talk about something I do. I'm not going to push it on you that I think reflects my view about fundamentals. I think people who use the Brazilian country risk premium for Embraer are making a mistake. I think people who use the Indian equity risk premium for Tata Consulting Services are making a mistake. Why? Because they're overstating the cost of equity. 
But think of what that does to the valuations that they do. So let's say everybody else in the world does the traditional thing, which is to give these companies high cost of equity, TCS and Embraer. And if you give a high cost of equity and a high discount rate, the value is much lower, right? Let's say the market goes along with them and puts a low price on these companies. But you believe in the long term that the truth will come out. The truth is these companies are not that risky. They look risky because they're incorporated in trade in Brazil and India. See the opportunity for you here? What could you do? You could go buy these stocks because you're basically going to, all of these people are going to push the value down too much because they're using too high a discount, right? If you bought these companies <clears throat> at the low prices, what's your pathway to make money? What has to happen? Way to make money on these stocks. Morris, so you bought these stocks, they're priced low because everybody's making the mistake of treating them as Brazilian and Indian companies, even though they get the bulk of their revenues outside. What has to happen for you to make money on these stocks? Uh, people would have to start buying them by realizing that they're-, that they're They have to realize that these companies are not risky, right? And yeah. that's always been the catch. How does that recognition come in? I actually bought Embraer in September of 2004 because I believe that markets were seriously overestimating the risk. And over the next four years, Brazil had good times, bad times, swinging all over the place. But here's the one thing that seemed to happen quarter after quarter. Embraer reported nice solid growth in earnings and revenues because they were selling into the US and the Western European market in dollar terms. They were not subject to that. So quarter after quarter, you'd know Brazil going all over the place, but Embraer was delivering these nice, solid earnings growth and margins. It took a long time. I had to wait till almost what, 2008 or nine for that realization to sink in. And the way it showed it was finally one quarter, it's almost like the market woke up and said, hey, you know what, Embraer is not that risky. I'm not suggesting that this is a foolproof strategy, but I actually have, I have a list of like, 10 emerging markets and I have one company in each emerging market that I use as my indicator, that the company that I think I will watch. So in Vietnam, it's Venema because they get a big chunk of the revenues outside Vietnam, but they're treated as a Vietnamese company. In India, it could be TCS, Infosys, any of the tech companies. In Brazil, it's companies like Embraer. And I, I initially, I just get the names of the companies and I sit and wait, wait for what? for a crisis in that market. He's saying, what if a crisis doesn't come? It's an emerging market. It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. There will always be a crisis. And when there's a crisis in these markets, what tends to happen, Rodrigo? What do people do when they get scared in Brazil? It happened after the car wash scandal. It happened. Just sell, sell all the... Especially foreign institutional investors. They sell everything. Then indiscriminate. They sell Embraer, they sell Embratel, they push everything down. And if you have that name already on your list, this is your chance, right? People are desperate, they're selling everything, you step in and buy. I mean, I have at least five stocks in my portfolio that I have now that I bought during crises because I think the market seriously messes up how country risk gets priced in. We're almost at the end, but I'm gonna set up what's coming next. For all of these risk premiums so far though, I started the US risk premium. And the way we computed the US risk premium was by looking backwards. And I said, I don't like that. Historical data is screwed up. Next session when we start, I'm gonna introduce a concept of equity risk premium, which is forward looking and dynamic. Like next session is tomorrow. So basically, remember there's, you guys know this class tomorrow. I didn't even know this till this semester started. This is a very strange semester because usually we start this class a week before the MBA class. This semester we start in the same day, but you get 28 sessions instead of 26, which is good, right? You, you know, because you, tuition gets you two extra sessions. So one of those extra sessions is tomorrow. So don't forget to show up tomorrow. So if you have other plans, cancel them, show up in class, because tomorrow when we start, I'm gonna take you through the process of getting this forward looking implied premium and how that can kind of replace the historical premium and give you more, both a more updated and a more precise estimate of what the equity risk premium is. So that's pretty much all for today. Any final questions before I sign off?
I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what if this is like, I guess, pretty specific, but what if you're looking at a region that's like very fragmented, um, like going through a civil war, for example, or something like that? Um, Are you talking about a country or an entire region? A country, sorry. Okay. Um, so it doesn't have to be hypothetical. It could be the Sudan. It could be uh, Myanmar right now, right? I mean, it's in a sense that Myanmar number that you saw is already passe because you've had this, you know, the, as you've probably read in the news, you know, you've had this, I don't even know what to call it, revolution. Or the government has been jailed. So clearly things are shaky, but I'm sorry to step in, but, but go ahead. So you're, you're looking at a country where there's tremendous uncertainty, a lot of stuff going on. What next? So if you're estimating the equity risk premium for that country, would right. you have to, I guess, go region specific? Because well, I'd like always like to do equity be... risk premiums by country, right? That's always better than doing it by region because when you bundle a region, take Latin Oh, America. sorry, not not like region as in like broad region, but like like states, for example, or like um, provinces, something like that. Like oh, you're saying within, the within a country, should I worry about the fact that you have a lot of factories in a part of the country that's... So it could be the East Timor region in Indonesia or something. Is that, is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Do you want to attach? I wouldn't even go there. I mean, do okay. you really want to do that? Do you I mean you'd have to do a political science degree on the side and do all kinds? I don't want to go there. I, I'm, I know it's tough enough figuring out a risk premium by country. It's even tougher doing it by parts of the country. So I wouldn't mess with it. Professor, I, I have a question. Yep. So um, I know that there's a Korean company called Ananti that um, invested in North Korea for because uh, they they do uh, resort hotels and resorts. Mm -hmm. um, but in that case, uh, if we were going to apply the lambda, uh, we cannot get the like. So let's assume that they get ten percent revenues from that. Uh, you know, like you're saying, towards... what does the typical North Korean company get? Out? Come on, how many? There's actually this is probably the only company in North Korea for all you know, right? Not yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, try. I would say just use the uh, weighted average equity risk. So let's say the South Korean company has 30% of its hotels in North Korea and 70% in South Korea. Uh -huh. I would take a weighted average. 70% times the South Korean equity risk premium, which is really low because South Korea is a safe, you know, pretty, you know, pretty stable part of the world. And 30% okay. times the North Korean premium, which is sky high. Mm -hmm. Right. So the overall equity risk premium would be high, but they could still be worth a lot. Why? Because you know, you have this North Korean hotel, you might be the only game in town. And to the extent that I don't know who comes and stays there, you yeah. can get high margins, high prices, who knows, the margins could make up for the higher risk. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely bring in that North Korean exposure through the weighted app. Don't do a Lambda. Lambda is just going to be painfully difficult. And that's why I said it's more the exception than the rule. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, can I also ask what's your rationale with the UAE? Because I saw that you uh, calculated the risk premium for Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Sharjah, and because, Raza Haima. Yeah, well, yeah, it's actually a but, good question. No, is it, let me ask you a question. Yeah. How do I get the risk premium? I look at the rating, right? And Moody's and S&P both rate UAE as a region and they also rate Abu Dhabi separately. The reason is very simple. Abu Dhabi is the safest part of the UAE because the oil revenues are premier. I mean, Abu Dhabi is the richest part of the UAE. So from that perspective, if all of your business is in Abu Dhabi, you're actually less exposed than if you tell me your business is spread all over the UAE. That's why this dude, see, it's the same reason Puerto Rico is not given the same rating as the US, right? It's a US territory, but because it's got a separate territory and it's got its own rating, you can use that rating to come up with the country risk premium for Puerto Rico. So that actually is, a, so somebody asked me about part, regions of the country, in a sense, I, we're doing that, right? Because you are breaking the UA into regions and saying different regions have different amounts of risk. Thank you. Somebody had a question about the weekly challenge they were going to ask me at the end. I don't see. I, I was going to ask about the weekly challenge anyway, uh, specifically about uh, how to adjust the growth assumptions. Um, well, the growth is given, right? It's 3%. All I do is you have to adjust the cash flows to reflect that. Growth. Right, right. right. 
So basically, when you have a 3% growth in a company and you want to keep your debt ratio fixed, your debt has to change over time. Otherwise, the debt ratio is going to change over time. So the biggest part in that part of the problem is allowing your debt to grow over time as your company grows, right? If you want to keep your debt ratio at 30%, if your company is growing, the debt has to grow. What does that mean? When you do free cash flows to equity, cash flows left, you know, that new debt will become a cash inflow. And if you don't factor that in, you're actually being internally inconsistent because in the cost to capital approach by keeping the debt ratio fixed, you're saying my debt is always 30% of value. If you don't bring that cash flow into the free cash flow to equity approach, you're going to get a different answer. And the reason you're getting it is because you're making different assumptions about debt in the free cash flow to equity. That's why I said this is perhaps the most tricky weekly challenge of all of them because it requires that you kind of think about implicit assumptions. When I use a cost to capital to value a company, what am I assuming? You're assuming your debt ratio stays fixed over time. What does it even mean? Well, if your company is growing over time, it means you're borrowing money each year to keep that debt ratio stable. We never make that explicit in a free cash flow to the firm valuation. In a free cash flow equity, you have no choice but to make it explicit. All right, that makes sense. Okay, folks, we're done. And remember again, we have class tomorrow, so don't forget to show up. All right, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Bye bye. Well, I have a quick question if you if you still have a second. Oops. I might have logged. Oh, go ahead. It's still on. Uh, yeah. So you talked about Royal Dutch and how essentially my question is how does um, say they were receiving their oil from a supplier based in those geographic areas. I, I would assume that has less of an effect on the on the premium than it would. Go ahead. Why though? The supplier has to get the oil, right? There's other because That's, there's other. I mean, the right? fact that you're one one level separated from the risk doesn't make it go away. I mean, I'll give you an no. example. Let's suppose you're a diamond mining company and you get 50% of your diamonds from the Congo and you're getting it from a supplier. And Congo goes into civil war, your supplies get cut off. Whether you do it directly or through a supplier is still exposed. You might be a little less exposed because you can switch suppliers, but the problem with natural resources is where are you gonna go? You've got to go where the diamonds are, where the oil is. And unfortunately, as I said, it's, you go all over the world, you're going to pay the price of, you know, of, where, of, of facing that risk. So I'm not sure having a supplier changes your risk profile that much. I mean, it depends on how asset heavy the, the company is in, an, in a case of the oil. It's nothing, but it's got nothing to do with assets. The risk we're talking about is the risk in the cash flows. I'm not concerned about nationalization or what you might do to my physical assets. I'm concerned about keeping the flow of oil going because oil doesn't come in, I can't sell the oil, right? This is a cash flow. I mean, the risk here is the risk in the cash flows. And I'm saying, if you're exposed to that risk through the operations of the company, I've got to build in that higher risk premium. So it's got very little. So you could be a service company, have no assets, and get all of your revenues in Myanmar and Cambodia. And guess what? Your cash flows are going to be all over the place, even though you have no physical assets, because these are risky countries where things change pretty quickly. So. So, the, so I think assets are, are a very small part of the puzzle. They might make it more difficult for you to move. So maybe that's your rationale. You say, I just yeah. have a supplier and that country's right. in trouble. I'll find a different supplier. But remember, yeah. suppliers don't pop out of nowhere, right? You got to find the supplier and if everybody's looked. So I'm not sure that this is, that your risk is any lessened because you can shift suppliers because you got to go to another part of the world where everybody else is fleeing to that part of the world. And you got to find suppliers, you know, who might be in short supply. So I'm not sure that that this solves the problem. I mean, all companies. That's why when you're heavily exposed to part of the world, I remember when Chevron got about 15% of its oil from Venezuela, and Venezuela went into contortions. Guess what? Chevron wasn't able to replace that oil, right. even though they might have had layers of people between them and the oil for almost six or seven years. That's how long it took them to find replacements for big chunks of revenues. Right. Okay. And then I guess the, the other thing I was thinking about was how is South Korea able to have such a low equity risk premium 
when countries either in the Middle East or in parts of Africa have, let's say we have a, let's say we have a relatively solid country, though it's, it's one of a, it's a bordering nation between like, let's say Yemen, their equity risk premium is going to be affected. But in South Korea, we're not seeing that equity risk premium be affected, even though they're literally you're bordering. Asking, you're asking me a political question of how, how is South Korea able to kind of hold its own? I mean, and all you yeah. need to do is look at I mean, what's, what's been the what's been the buffer in South Korea? Why can't North Korea? What would happen if tomorrow the North Korean forces? I mean, you do realize there's a U.S. line separating North and South Korea. Right, and there's also okay. U.S. And military. basically, the U.S. has been at least for a long time that that that. Def- I mean, how I don't know how good the defensive line is, but. I mean, South Korea is like, a, it, it, it's not as visible now, not that the rest of Asia is caught up. But I remember the first time I landed in Seoul and clearly you could see, I mean, it's that this, that, that this is a part of the world that was, at least at that point in time, way ahead of the rest of Asia in terms of development. Okay. So you can ask the political question, how did they pull that off? How did, how did Singapore? Right. You realize that Singapore at one point in time was part of Malaysia, right? Right. And of course, you know, over the period of the last 50 years, it's become one of the safest parts of the world to do right. business. It's a city state. And right. the question of how it maintains that, that safety is, is kind of a, is, is a challenging question that you can address by looking at how it deals with its citizens, what kind of requirements it has but there are parts of the world like that where you look at that part and it's clearly Uruguay in Latin America, right? It's like, it's a small country, it's in the middle, it's in its neighbors. I mean, I, I was in Uruguay a couple, three years ago and Uruguay borders Argentina. This is like having a crazy uncle in your attic. Right. <laughs> right, I mean, the, the, the crazy uncle is going to show up all the time. Right. But somehow they figured out a way to kind of insulate themselves the best they can, in fact, one of the things about being a stable country in the midst of chaos is you can market yourself as the place to go. So you know what Argentinians put their money when they get really worried about Argentina? They put it in Uruguay, in banks. So I think that in, in a strange way, sometimes being in the midst of chaos can be a big competitive advantage. You're the island of safety. Just make sure the chaos doesn't engulf you. That's interesting. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.